Welcome to this three-part educational series titled Hot Topics in Asthma, Increasing Control and Preventing Exacerbations. Each episode in the series will be dedicated to one of the following areas. Assessment of asthma control, updates on clinical evidence surrounding the efficacy of rescue therapies for asthma, and recommendations for as-needed asthma rescue therapy. This second episode in the series will provide information on the latest data supporting the efficacy, safety, and superiority of as-needed ICS-containing combination therapy in reducing exacerbations when compared to SABA-only treatment. The goal of this activity is to help clinicians understand why SABA-only treatment is no longer recommended, as well as how patient outcomes can be improved with proper use of combination rescue therapy. Thank you for joining, and let's get started. I'm Dr. Bradley Chips, the past president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and medical director of Capital Allergy and Respiratory Disease Center in Sacramento, California. Thank you for joining me, and let's get started. So now let's look at why we are moving away from short-acting beta agonist monotherapy as the primary rescue therapy for asthma. Although short-acting beta agonists do provide rapid relief for acute episodes of airway restriction or bronchospasm, short-acting beta agonists do not target ongoing underlying inflammation. In 2019, Gina departed from SABA monotherapy recommendations due to the safety risk associated with SABA overuse and reliance, higher risk for asthma-related death, severe exacerbations in urgent care-related uh, visits are present in those patients, increased exacerbations managed with oral corticosteroid lead to increased OCS-associated adverse events. There's also a poor long-term outcome and potentially detriment to lung function and a tendency to underuse inhaled corticosteroid. Anti-inflammatory benefit of ICS on edema and mucus is preferred. So we're now going to look at two recently published studies about the new medication that is going to be available in the United States uh, early next year. And this is a fixed dose combination rescue inhaler for asthma. This was first described in the Mandela study published in the New England Journal in May of last year. It's a multinational phase three double blind randomized event-driven trial that looked at the safety and efficacy of an albuterol budesonide as compared to albuterol alone as rescue medication in patients with uncontrolled moderate to severe asthma. You should note that the patients continued their regular maintenance therapy and were randomized into one of three groups to have albuterol 180 plus 160 micrograms of budesonide or albuterol 180 with budesonide 80 micrograms or albuterol alone 180 micrograms. This was an event-driven study that was terminated when 570 acute exacerbations of asthma occurred. 3,132 patients were randomized. The risk of severe asthma exacerbation was significantly lower by 26% in the high-dose albuterol budesonide group compared to albuterol alone. And this resulted in the FDA's approval uh, of the drug to be marketed for patients 18 years of age and older. It also decreased the need for oral corticosteroid by 41% in these patients. So this fixed-dose combination inhaler allows us to intervene in the window of opportunity before an exacerbation to try to prevent that exacerbation from happening. In order to uh, gain approval for these drugs, we had to do the Denali study. This was a phase three double-blind randomized uh, controlled trial of patients greater than 12 years of age with mild to moderate asthma. There were four treatment arms in this group. They were all given four times a day. Albuterol budesonide, 180 linked to 160 micrograms of budesonide. Albuterol, 180 uh, linked to 80 micrograms of budesonide. Albuterol, 180 by itself four times a day. Or budesonide, 160 micrograms 
four times a day or placebo. A total of, of 1,000 patients were randomized. Change from baseline in FEV1, area under the curve, zero to six hours over 12 weeks was greater with albuterol budesonide in the higher dose versus budesonide 160. So this gives us the contribution of albuterol. The change in trough FEV1 at week 12 was greater with, again, the albuterol budesonide higher dose group compared to albuterol. This gives us insight into the contribution of budesonide. So the day one time of onset and duration of action of bronchodilatation with albuterol budesonide was similar to those with albuterol. The albuterol budesonide profile uh, for adverse events was similar to that of all the monocomponents. So this was an FDA mandated study for, for the combination rule in order for this inhaler to be approved, which it has been approved already. Also, it's important to look at uh, larger randomized controlled trials to demonstrate the superiority of ICS for Motorol reliever in reducing severe exacerbations compared to short acting beta agonists. This, these are articles published in the New England Journal of Medicine in May of 2018. First, a study by Paul O'Brien looked at mild patients with asthma using as needed budesonide for motorol, which was superior to terbutaline in preventing exacerbations and loss of lung function in patients with mild asthma who are not on regular asthma controller therapy. The annual rate of severe exacerbations was 0.2 with terbutaline and 0 0.07 with budesonide for Motorol. Then looking at a population of patients with more significant asthma, this is Eric Bateman's study published in the same issue of the New England Journal. As needed, budesonide for Motorol was not inferior to budesonide given regularly with respect to the rate of severe exacerbations during a 52-week study of the treatment of patients with asthma and what's important to understand, by just using budesonide from Motorol as needed, one quarter of inhaled corticosteroid exposure was present for these patients, which is, a, I think, a very important observation. So although we know that this study was accomplished uh, XUS, done with a dry powdered turbohaler of budesonide from Motorol, that inhaler is not available in the United States. This uh, format for therapy is not approved by the FDA in the United States, but has received great traction in the rest of the uh, world. What this really means for our practice is that we have to understand that reliance to albuterol causes patients to have increased risk of deterioration not only in their lung function, but also increase in exacerbations. And that at all steps of asthma care, it's important to link the use of a short or long-acting beta agonist with budesonide at all steps of care when we are treating an acute exacerbation. And that the PRN use, or as needed use, of short-acting beta agonist and ICS should not be uh, extrapolated to using this product as maintenance therapy for asthma. Maintenance therapy has to be long-acting beta agonist combined with an inhaled corticosteroid, and then the short-acting beta agonist ICS drug can be used as an as needed strategy in the United States because, again, the formoterol budesonide preparation in the United States is not uh, approved for this. Also, the uh, short-acting albuterol uh, budesonide as needed therapy can be used with any other combination long-acting beta agonist and ICS as an as-needed strategy. And I think this is going to be a very important and novel breakthrough for therapy for asthma in the United States and hopefully will become the standard of care. There's going to be some concerns about getting this approved by formulary committees and having the insurance companies cover it because we have generic albuterol already in the market and primatine mist over the counter, which are going to be cheaper preparations, but clearly are inferior in their uh, ability to prevent exacerbations. Thank you for joining me 
for this Hot Topics program. You can view other episodes from this series on the landing page. For additional CME opportunities, clinical resources, and links to patient education materials, please visit us at www.exchangecme.com.